Next thing we're going to take a look at is four knights and uh, the idea of a fork. So we're going to play the opening that we've been learning. Knight coming out to f3, knight coming out to c6. And now instead of developing this bishop, we're going to develop the knight. So the knight is going to come out over to c3 and then black's knight is going to come out to f6. So now you guys can see four knights developed. This is what the opening is all about. The four knights coming out closer towards the middle. And one of the sides is going to try to capture the rest of the center. Okay, so both sides are going to be fighting for the middle of the board. So white's bishop is going to come out here to c4. Remember, bishop comes out to c4. Black is going to sacrifice the knight, as we were learning, sacrifice. So black is going to sacrifice the knight for the pawn on e4. And as you can see, this pawn is not free, because white can actually go ahead and capture that knight. So as white captures the knight, black has an idea in mind. Black is going to get that knight back, get a piece back, and the way to do it is to make a fork. Black is going to make a fork on the bishop and the knight. So how can black accomplish it? Queen's pawn is going to push forward and the move is d5. d5. And as black plays d5 attacking the knight and the bishop, black is creating a fork. White can give up the bishop for a pawn, but that would give black the material back, give black that piece that black just sacrificed. And as white picks up this pawn, the queen can recapture the pawn over from d8 with a queen. We say don't let the queen out too early, but as you can see, this is a different kind of position. Black actually got the bishops coming out here pretty easily. And the queen is out here is actually a pretty active position at this point. As the bishops come out, black is going to castle. The queen is actually here on an ideal position out there in the middle. So now we're going to take a look at another variation where white is actually going to retreat the bishop, aiming to uh, give up the knight for the pawn, where the bishop can go ahead and recapture the pawn on e4. Pawn takes e4. And as the pawn uh, captures the e4, bishop picks it up. And at this point, bishop can develop over to d6. Now we're going to see another gambit. And we start off with the gambit starting with e4, pushing for d4. Now we're actually going to learn a new opening. And that is called Quinn's Gambit. Pawn pushes forward. Black plays d5, and at this point, the idea of Queen's Gambit is we're actually going to sacrifice a pawn, and the pawn would be pushing c4 up here. So giving up a pawn on the wing. So the idea of a gambit a lot of times is to generate a great development, at the same time distract your opponent from controlling some of the middle squares. So we can actually, at this point, grab the whole middle of the board and the center of the board is essential to your ability to develop the pieces really well and grab some space and generate the attack. So as we push the pawn forward, I'm actually going to try uh, a smaller move here, pushing the pawn over to e3 and here we're going to examine a, a famous trap. This is actually something that my father taught me back in the day. So pawn goes over to e3 and then black is going to try to defend the pawn. The correct way is actually to just let it go and continue the development for black. For example, bringing the knight out, letting this bishop from f1 go to go ahead and capture the pawn on c4. So it's not a big deal. Now, if black does try to defend the pawn, now white is going to try to break this pawn structure up. And in order to do that, White is going to send this pawn forward over to a4. So the pawn is attacking the pawn on b5. 
if B takes A, then both of these pawns are actually going to be pretty weak. So white is going to be able to pick up the pawn on C4 and going to be able to pick up the pawn on A4. So both pawns are actually going to go down. So in order to defend those, black would need to support the pawn on B5 and A6 doesn't really work too well because as soon as A6 is played, white goes ahead and captures the pawn on B5 and if A takes B, as you guys could tell, this rook from A1 is going to go and capture the rook on A8 and black is going to be down the rook. So we don't want to play the move A6. So what would be another way to defend the pawn on B5 so they can protect the pawn on C4 to maintain this pawn chain? In order to do that, black is going to have to play C6 defending the pawn on B5. Now, even that is not going to help black since white is going to take, pawn takes, and at this point white has the opportunity to win a whole piece. How does white take advantage of black's situation here? Well, the idea is to throw the queen out here to f3, and this is a trap that my father used on me a couple times until I learned, figured out how to avoid it. So the queen comes out over to f3, and the queen is hitting out there the rook on a8. So in order to block off white's pressure, black is going to need to put something between the queen and the rook, and it's a little bit tough to do. So the best black can do is get the knight over to c6 where white goes ahead and captures the knight attacking the king and the rook where bishop is going to be developed over to d7 and block the queen at the same time the queen is defending the rook. So as the queen retreats white is going to enjoy a whole extra piece for just a pawn. Now our topic would be the king's gambit. The gambit that starts off on the king's side of the board. We tried the queen's gambit on the queen's side, the king's gambit is on the king's side. So guess what? White is going to sacrifice this pawn playing f4. And we're going to learn the upside and the downside to that. And the potential trap that you guys can set. So as the pawn pushes forward to f4, Black can choose to pick it up, that would be one of the best moves here for black to play. And as the pawn takes the pawn on f4, white is going to need to first get the knight over to f3. In order to guard the square on h4 from the queen penetrating and uh, making a check to the king here. So as black develops, white is going to find a lot of space here in the middle to conquer and push those pawns forward. And it's going to be difficult for black to uh, first protect this pawn and then uh, play against white's great development here. For example, if white gets all these pieces out and manages to pick up this pawn right here. Well, here, look, white's got a perfect development here with this nice central pawns in the middle, the pieces aligning really well, and white going to castle with this open file for the rook here on F file. So black is going to try to set a little trap at the very beginning and instead of picking up this pawn on F4 as white plays the king's gambit after F4 black is going to wait a moment and actually see if white is going to capture the pawn on E5. So black continues with bishop C5 and as the bishop comes out to C5 Guess what happens if white picks up the pawn on e5? This is a very similar idea, but actually even stronger than the idea of the scholars made here. At this point, white is already messed up. So white is not supposed to take the pawn on e5. White is supposed to be developing the knight over to f3. In which case, the best thing black can do is support the pawn on e5 with d6. Here, if black decides to pick up this pawn on f4, once again, we're going to come back to our idea of conquering the middle, picking up this pawn on f4, great development, and white is going to be capturing the center of the board and having a very strong, fast development. 
Now, if white does pick up this pawn after bishop c5, if white does pick up this pawn on e5, black is going to have is going to have the opportunity to attack the king. And the idea would be to bring the queen out here on the edge, hitting the king on e1. Queen h4 check. And really, if king pushes forward, then black got the game right here. Queen takes e4, and that is a checkmate. Queen makes a check, and this is a mate because the king cannot escape the attack of the queen, and the bishop controlling the square here on f2. Similarly to the previous examples that we looked at, as queen makes a check here, and white def decides to defend with g3, as g3 is played, black is going to pick up the pawn on e4, attacking the king on e1, queen makes a check, and as white blocks, let's say, with a queen, black is going to go ahead and pick up this rook right here, win it for nothing, and at the same time the knight is hanging out there on g1, meaning hanging meaning just about ready to be captured. So this is the idea of King's Gambit where white is wanting to expand in the middle and conquer the territory in the middle by playing f4, sacrificing this pawn and as black gets to pick it up, white is aiming to establish a strong formation in the middle and support them by the light pieces, castle quick and then generate the attack against the opponent. At the same time, as we learn, we learned a little trap out here as black waits for white to capture the pawn on e5. This is actually a trap that my grandfather taught me how to play and it took me a couple of attempts to figure out what, what to do exactly to avoid that trap. And as black waits for white to pick it up, the wise thing for white to do would be to develop the knight, otherwise uh, white would be in deep trouble after the queen coming out to h4 and attacking the king. 